Welcome to the Presbyterian Journey. I'm the Reverend Lucas Levy Keppel, and I'm glad you're here with me today. This is the fourth part of our series as we continue to navigate the Presbyterian Journey. Like a sightseeing trip at sea, we can't stay too long in any one place. So if anything we discuss today piques your interest, I encourage you to leave a comment and or reach out to your pastor who can give you much more in-depth resources. Last week we saw the Reformation branch out in Geneva with Calvin leading the way uh, to finding ways to keep the government and the church in their own spheres of influence but working together. Today we're hopping the channel, traveling up the coastline of Great Britain, going across Hadrian's Wall until we find ourselves in solid Edinburgh, part of the Kingdom of Scotland. In the middle of the 16th century, Scotland was also getting caught up in the Reformation fever sweeping Europe. As their Catholic kings had tried invading England twice in 50 years, and both lost their lives in the process, the Scottish Parliament was not inclined towards Catholicism. As the Parliament gained control, ruling in fact while the Queen Mary was an infant, they wanted to devise something on a national scale similar to what Calvin had accomplished in Geneva. So they hired a homegrown minister and theologian named John Knox, a protege of Calvin, to help them figure it out. You see, Knox had been ordained as a Catholic priest in 1540. But after serving as a tutor to sons of Reformation-leaning lairds, he started favoring Reformation ideas. In 1547, Knox was serving as a preacher and tutor in the castle of St. Andrews, protecting the boys he was tutoring from the assassins that had killed their fathers. Unfortunately, the castle was besieged and captured by the French. Under orders from the Scottish regent, and Knox was forced to serve as a rower on French galley ships. This was a difficult and thankless indenture that also caused him to suffer abuse at the hands of Catholics. To give you a sense of who Knox was, in one story that he told of this time, a prisoner on the galley was required to show devotion to a painting of the Virgin Mary. The prisoner was told to give it a kiss of veneration. He refused, and when the picture was pushed up to his face, the prisoner seized the picture and threw it into the sea, saying, Let Our Lady now save herself. She is light enough. Let her learn to swim. After two years of hard labor on the galleys, Knox was able to secure a license to work in exile in England as a priest in the newly formed Anglican Church. He was forced to use the Book of Common Prayer, though he did modify it based on the work of Calvin in Geneva. It wasn't all bad in England, though, as Knox met his wife Marjorie Bowes through his first parish. But when Mary Tudor became Queen of England, Knox was forced to flee again, this time heading first to Frankfurt in Germany, then to Geneva, where he was tasked with preaching three sermons a week, each one over two hours long. Think about that next time you complain about sermons being too long in church. In 1558, Knox published his most famous work, the first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women. In this, he excoriates the English Catholic Queen Mary Tudor and the French Catholic Mary of Guise, who was regent for the still underage Scottish Queen Mary Stuart. And in it, he calls Catholicism evil and women rulers unnatural, perhaps understandably given all of the troubles he's been having. Unfortunately for him, it was just at this time that the Catholic Queen Mary Tudor died and Protestant Queen Elizabeth came to the throne in England. Queen Elizabeth did not look favorably on the disparagement of women rulers, and Knox was not welcome to return to England as a result. He did make his way back to his country of birth and started preaching Protestant doctrine and against his perception of Catholic idolatry. His sermons were so persuasive that mobs formed afterward and people went through the streets destroying Catholic property 
and seizing it, ransacking the cathedrals in the towns where he preached. Knox and other Protestant reformers were so successful in their campaign against Catholicism that even the troops guarding the Catholic Queen Regent Mary of Guise were convinced to switch sides. Mary of Guise was deposed by Scottish Parliament in 1559, and the fiercely Protestant Parliament in Edinburgh hired Knox and five other men to write a new confession of faith and guidelines for the governance of this new Protestant nation. In just four days, the six men, all of whom were named John, as it happens, composed the Scots Confession and quickly followed it with the Form of Prayers and the First Book of Discipline. Unlike the English Book of Common Prayer, the Form of Prayers was a general guide to the structure of worship, rather than a strict regiment that had to be followed. It forms the basis of the Directory for Worship in the Presbyterian Book of Order to this day. The first book of discipline uh, described Presbyterian polity and order in detail. It moved power away from individual bishops to shared elected groups called presbyteries. The idea was that an individual might be corrupted, but a group of people with shared power might be able to hear the call of the Spirit even against the depravity that they themselves fell into as sinners. Throughout these works, the political ideas are clearly influenced by the theology of Knox and Calvin. There is great support for universal education, revolution against tyranny, and the suggestion that government should assist in caring for the indigent and poor, a practice that had rarely been practiced systematically in the medieval European society. Let's now dive into the Scots Confession. This confession is the first Reformed confession written originally in English and was designed to roughly parallel the Apostles' Creed. The Scots saw themselves in continuity with the ancient church and tried to show how their interpretation was correct as opposed to the Catholic tradition and opposed to the Counter-Reformation which had begun in Trent in 1546. Theologically, the Scots confession hits three major points. First, that the doctrine of election is that God has chosen us for grace and that Jesus' choice to die for us allowed God's grace to be enacted. Second, that the visible church is not the same thing as the true church. And thirdly, that discipline is necessary for living a Christian life. We've already spoken about election, so let's look at the next doctrine a bit further. A great deal of the Scots Confession is dedicated to separating out the true church from the visible church. The idea was that not all that claimed to be the church actually was the church. It was important to be able to distinguish what was true from what only appeared to be the church. To that end, the Scots Confession identifies three signs of the true church. True preaching of the Word of God right administration of the sacraments, and upright administration of ecclesiastical discipline. Since this confession and others like it, there's been arguing about what these different definitions actually look like. But at least in the early Presbyterian church, the idea was that preaching was central to worship, and that anything that distracted from the word was at the very least suspicious, if not outright dangerous. That's why the Scottish Presbyterian Church originally only allowed psalms to be sung, designing tunes to be used with multiple psalms, each translated to fit a meter. Many of these tunes are still with us today, including Old Hundredth, which is the tune commonly used with the doxology and as the outro music for this series. Over the years, the Presbyterian Church has turned from an iconoclastic, bare-walled ideal to looking at music and art as encouragement to prayerful engagement. In fact, the current directory for worship says, music as prayer is a worthy offering to God on behalf of the people. We must always keep in mind the balance between distraction and engagement, however. I'd like to end this episode with how the directory for worship describes the utility of art in worship these days. The Reformed Heritage, 
has called upon people to bring worship material offerings, which in their simplicity of form and function direct attention to what God has done and to the claim that God makes upon human life. The people of God have responded through creative expressions in architecture, furnishings, appointments, vestments, music, drama, language, and movement. When these artistic creations awaken us to God's presence, they are appropriate for worship. When they call attention to themselves or are present for their beauty as an end in themselves, they are idolatrous. Artistic expressions should evoke, edify, enhance, and expand worshippers' consciousness of the reality and grace of God. And with that, we come to the end of the Road to Reformation, this first section of our Presbyterian journey. I hope that you've felt an enhancement of your consciousness of the reality and grace of God through this series, and would love to hear your feedback about it so far. Please leave a comment, and be sure to return next week as we begin the second section of our journey, New World Reformation. Yes, we're finally going to hop the pond and start talking about Presbyterians in what will become the United States of America. May God's blessings be with you. Thank you for joining the Presbyterian journey.